14 of chapter 1, looking at how Jesus is better than the angels. And we also considered what the writer was for that Jesus had become even as much superior to angels. Again, in verse 4 through 14, the writer had shown us from the Old Testament scriptures, in fact, seven explicit citations, how the angelic messengers did not have authority in themselves, but rather they pointed to the ultimate authority of the Son, who is the promised and final Davidic king. Again, this is why in verse 13, towards the end of our study last week, the writer had asked, well, to which of the angels had God the Father ever said? And again, he quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, about what the Father says to the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Of course, the simple and assertive answer from Hebrews regarding verse 13 is no one else. The Father had said to no one else to sit at his right hand. Only to the incarnate risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the promised Davidic King, he had sit at his right hand upon that throne. And he sat there with all authority in heaven and on earth. And again, we learned that in all of this, Jesus is greater than the angels. I think we'll even find, continuing in chapter 2, that Jesus' superiority over the angels has a life-changing application and internal, uh, eternal importance and significance. And so again, as we've been reminded already, we ought to look to and listen to Jesus Christ. We ought to pay attention to the message which has now been delivered by the authority and the superiority of the risen Son. And so what we're going to do is really look briefly at verse 14 of chapter 1, and then we'll look at the first four verses of chapter 2. And there I think we'll see the comparison that while the angels had often appeared to deliver God's message, God has now spoken his message through his Son, And so we'll consider the work of these ministering spirits in verse 14 of chapter 1. And then we'll examine the final message delivered by the Son in chapter 2. And so we'll go to read first verse 14 of chapter 1 and into verse 4 of chapter 2. And so hear the word of our great God. The writer of Hebrews asks, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Therefore, we must pay close, much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away, drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord And it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And praise be to God for his word. Now, of course, as we continue on in our study into chapter 2, we're reminded that we live in a time where there is much talking but there is rarely listening. There is so much seeing and looking upon information, but there are few who really genuinely look. And so we have a critical need to pay attention. And I think this is especially true as we come to look at the important message of the gospel. Again, the issue of paying attention isn't new. Uh, This isn't a new instruction. This is an old problem that many have overlooked and even disregarded. Uh, Again, think of how back in the garden, how Eve treated and spoke of the commands of God in Genesis 3 verse 3, when she told the serpent, even if we touch the fruit, we'll die, uh, which was not part of the commandment. And so here we have always been warned, as we see in the scriptures, in God's word, of how we are to pay closer 
attention. And we're to pay closer attention to the commands and the message of God that we may endure and remain devoted rather than escape, as the writer of Hebrews says, or drift away. Again, we find these kinds of warnings and instructions to pay closer attention, to be careful in our gathering, in our living, in our hearing, all throughout the Christian life. In fact, the writer of Ecclesiastes, when talking about coming to the house of the Lord, says in chapter 5, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. Again, I think it ought to be an important principle in our Lord's Day gatherings. Guard your mouth and your heart from yourself. Listen and pay attention in the house of the Lord. Again, I think we'll find in our text how we ought to be careful to not neglect any detail. Now again, I mentioned at the beginning of our time that we'll look briefly at verse 14 because there we find the comparison of how God has been conveying his message and how he has ministered to his people. Again, the writer is pointing forward in chapter 1 of how the angels are not only subordinate to the authority of the Son, but they are also ministering for the sake of Christ's people. Again, as we read in verse 14, the writer asks, Are they, the angels, not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Again, here I think the writer is contrasting the angels' rightful place and work in comparison to the authority of the risen Son. He's reminding us here that this is their given role and purpose in redemptive history. And so first, even looking back in the Old Testament, we get a picture of how the angels ministered to God's people. In fact, in Genesis chapter 18 and 19, we find that Abraham is speaking with the Lord and he's pleading with him to not destroy Sodom. Even he goes down, if there are 50 who are righteous, if there are 30 who are righteous, if there are 10 But God did send angels to destroy Sodom and rescue Lot. In Genesis 19, verse 15 and 16, we're told that as morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. And so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. That's a very fascinating picture. Angels are sent to destroy the wicked and rescue or minister to the righteous who the Lord was merciful to. Again, this is often the picture we see of angels ministering in the Old Testament. In Psalm 91 verse 11, we're told the Lord will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And again, in Psalm 103, we see a bit of an outline on the focus and work of the angels before the Lord. Where the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. They are servants of the Lord. They are servants who the psalmist says do his will and proclaim his word. Again, we find angels all throughout the Old and New Testament. In fact, in Genesis chapter 28, verse 12, Jacob has that famous prophetic dream that we call Jacob's ladder, where it says, Behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now again, we learn this is the prophecy of Jacob's ladder, which Jesus points to as explaining him and his work. He is the ladder. 
the way between God and man and his angels are ministering and worshiping upon and through him. And that is not simply perspective. That is from the mouth of Jesus in John chapter 1. In verse 51, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so again, when we think of the angels, this is their given role and purpose in redemptive history. They worship the Lord and they minister in various ways to God's people. I think A.W. Pink is helpful to us when we think about the angel's work. And verse 14, Pink says, It should awaken within us a sense of wonderment. The angels are portrayed as our attendants. When we remember who and what they are, their exalted rank and the scale of being, their singleness, their wondrous capacities, knowledge, and powers, It is surely an astonishing thing to learn that they should minister to us. Now again, remember what the writer of Hebrews had began to proclaim to put our understanding of angels in a proper focus. In verse 4 of chapter 1, the writer said, Christ has become as much superior to angels. How and, and why? As the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Again, this is what proved that the message and the finished work of Christ was far greater and much more superior than the message previously delivered by angels. And so as we think of the great gospel that has been secured in the Lord Jesus Christ, look at how the writer turns in chapter 2 in verse 1. He says, therefore, In light of the superiority of the reign of Jesus Christ and the angelic beings who serve him and his people, the writer says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Again, the first audience had known in many ways and in various times that God proclaimed revelation through his angels. We had looked at several passages over the last several weeks, but I think one of the the key passages that I don't believe I put in your notes for Israel would have been Moses' declaration in Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. And Paul brings this up in Galatians 3, 19 as well. And yet we've learned that despite the fact that God had proclaimed in this way in a profound uh, era we have learned that the message and the work of Jesus Christ is better. It is superior to the angels. And so the warning that we find here in chapter 2, which is really the first of several, is to cause us to take this message of Jesus Christ very serious. Again, this is why the writer says in verse 2, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Now again, the concern for the preacher is not that you'll forget his stories or his illustrations. I gave up long ago that I would be funny. That's not why we're here. It's not an eloquent comment about doctrine or theology. The concern, I would say, of every honest, genuine preacher is that you will hear the gospel clearly explained and exhorted but you will still not listen. Again, I don't think, when we, when we think about hearing the message, I don't think the issue is that all of a sudden you have people that woke up one morning and do a completely different shift. I don't think that it's someone who wakes up one Lord's Day morning and says, you know what, I'm done listening to my pastors. I don't think they wake up one morning from a, from a serious faithful Christian life, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they say, you know what? The preachers preach the same old things. They have the same old liturgy. I'm just going to kind of zone out. I'll be there, but I'm not really going to be there. I don't think that it's from a morning of people saying, I don't feel the affection or the attention I once did towards the word of God, so in this moment, I'm just going to stop reading as regular as I have been. 
I don't think that's where the all of a sudden apostasy happens. I think that's where the drift begins. I don't think it comes all of a sudden out of nowhere. I think it's from subtle, overtime compromises in a Christian's life where they choose to become indifferent rather than diligent, where they choose to be apathetic rather than authentic, where they choose to drift, as the writer would say, rather than to be devoted. In fact, behind the the verbiage that the writer of Hebrews uses in verse 1 for drift away is literally the idea of a leaky boat. You could use the illustration that it's one who sits in a boat and goes, the leak won't get that bad. And lo and behold, then you're, you're sinking. And so again, the writer says, we, much, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Again, church, this is a very real warning. It was a very present issue in the ministry of both the early church and the Old Testament prophets. Again, the one that I often think about is Isaiah. That after having the incredible heavenly vision of the throne room and the forgiveness and atonement of sins, he turns to hear the Lord say in Isaiah 6, 8, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And then I said, Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. And here we find Isaiah was commissioned by the Lord to prophetically proclaim his message. But while we greatly value and appreciate Isaiah's ministry today, The Lord told Isaiah it would be a hard ministry due to the hearts and minds of the people. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, he says, Go and say to the people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes. It's a wonderful pastoral commission, isn't it? Could you imagine if we had read that the, the, the week last week when we prayed over our new elders? Listen, go and say to the people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but don't perceive. But again, the Lord's message seems dull to people who ignore and grow cold towards the call and the commands of God. Even at the close of Jesus' own public ministry, And as he's proclaiming his message of salvation, he encounters the same roadblock. Uh, John writes that this was in fulfillment, in fact, of Jesus's, or I'm sorry, Isaiah's own ministry. In John chapter 12, John writes that after Jesus had proclaimed his message, in verse 37 through 40, he said, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 39, therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. Now again, I'm taking all of this time not simply to survey the difficulties of prophetic and apostolic ministries, but ultimately to remind you that there is a very real concern and warning when it comes to really listening and paying attention to the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, Again, in my pastoral prayer, I I shared with you James chapter 1. That's a reminder that we ought to be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving ourselves. Why? Why? Because James goes on to tell us, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. How often do we hear sermons and listen to podcasts and then immediately forget? How often do we look in the mirror and immediately forget? And so again, we ought to pay closer attention to what we've heard because the outcome of neglecting such a salvation has massive consequences. Again, these warnings in Hebrews, we ought to understand, are directed towards Christians. These are not warnings 
to the fake believer, to the one who we go, hey, I'm glad you're here this Sunday, but you better listen up. The writer of Hebrews is speaking to Christians and giving them very real warnings. And they are intended, these warnings, to prompt us to pay closer attention to the message of Jesus Christ. And so we ought to pay closer attention to what we have heard concerning the Lord. Why? Lest we drift away from it. Uh, the King James translates verse 1, We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Again, church, if we will not listen and pay attention to the message of Christ declared and delivered, there is nothing else that will profit the soul and instruct the sinner in life and godliness. And so this is why the most concerning possibility would be for us, if we let these things slip, it would be concerning if all of a sudden we decide to just hit cruise control in the Christian life, where the means of grace, the prayer, the preaching of God's word, the scripture, the Lord's Supper and baptism just become meaningless to us. Where we just hit cruise control to the message and it becomes dull, in fact, to our minds and our hearts. That's a terrifying possibility. And so again, the writer is warning us, we ought to pay even closer attention when we sense that in ourselves so that we do not drift away. Again, we ought to pay even closer attention. Have you ever looked at some of the notes of some of your brothers and sisters that they take during sermons? I don't take that good of notes. And I'm often challenged about how closely they're paying attention. And it's a reminder, we ought to look upon that even in the example of our brothers and sisters, how they're paying attention to the message of the gospel and how we ought to pay even more attention. Because we have a tendency in persecution, in challenges, in fatigue, in busyness to really sit back and find ourselves in routine. Uh, the other morning as I was driving to work uh, around 4 a.m., I was thinking intently on how important it is to pay closer attention. Probably a wise thing to consider during a drive at 4 in the morning. But I mentally noted the things of which I really wasn't paying attention to with great intention. Uh, because of the repetition. Because of the way in which that is my routine and drive to work. But there are warnings to citizens as they drive throughout Skagit County. Uh, we see signs often, don't stop on train tracks. I was surprised to realize I didn't know there were five on the way to Cook Road. There are speed limits, there are traffic lights, there are street markers for safety and clarity on the road. But again, we must remember, those warnings aren't there to threaten citizens. They are there to remind them and to call them to action so that they may go about their lives in safety and upright citizenship. And so church, this is the same with the warning in Hebrews. It is not there to terrify you and threaten you. Get better or get out. It is to say, do not allow the things of this world and the things that distract to take priority in your life above and before the message of Jesus Christ. Again, I think we ought to ask, what might we be missing in the Lord's Day service, in our Bible reading, in our Christian living with one another, because we are simply going through the motions or not paying attention? See, again, in considering this first warning here in chapter 2, we should not think that the Christian life could be one of casual attendance and careless faith concerning the things of Christ. I think rather we ought to take the warning serious and really understand that this warning and the rest of the warnings are directed at us to call us to a very serious faith and a devoted living in Christ. Again, I think we find an intentional similar warning when Jesus told his disciples in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. 
For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burnt. And so again, church, we ought to take the message of Christ and all that it calls us to in life and practice very serious. Now again, notice in verse 2 that we're told how serious the message truly is. Look at verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3 in your Bibles. The writer says, For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And so if what was given at the height of the old covenant under Moses, was reliable, and rejection of this previous message was punishable, then how much more ought we to not only consider the message of Jesus Christ, but also care about the eternal outcome of it? Again, it's no wonder that James tells the believers at the end of his letter, in James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, my brothers, If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. See, the response to such biblical warnings ought to encourage and exhort the Christian to cling to the message of Jesus Christ and realize He is the mediator of a new and better covenant, of a new and better message. Now understand, the previous message, which we know from the Old Testament, was given, was the giving of the moral law and the proclamation of the promised Messiah. That was made known by angelic messengers and the Lord through prophets, priests, and kings. And in this, God had conveyed under the old covenant for the people of God what was required for righteous relationship, right relationship with him. Uh, Again, the message really summed up. Pastor Andrew and I were talking at the beginning of the service. Do this and live. Don't do this and die. Again, this is what God required. He proclaimed the message through, by angelic messengers, through prophets, priests, and kings. But of course, as the first martyr Stephen had proclaimed in Acts chapter 7, we learn in verse 52 and 53 of his speech, which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You received the law under the direction of angels, and yet have not kept it. Now again, regardless of the punishment for disobedience and the promise for obedience, the message, Stephen tells us, was not kept. But since the message was authentic and even authenticated by witnesses, it was proved to be an authoritative word in the exposing of sin and the calling one to obedience. Now again, the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand this is all the more true in the great salvation of Jesus Christ. In fact, this first warning here in chapter 2 flies in the face of the notion that we can relax now because we no longer have to deal with the God of judgment in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. Now we have the soft message of Jesus under the new covenant. But again, at the heart of the warning, what the writer is greatly urging against is this very thing. Do not think this message is lesser than. If there is punishment under the old, there is far more punishment and concern in this greater message of salvation. It carries with it, in fact, even more serious proclamations and punishments. In fact, we see this later in chapter 10 when the writer says in verse 28 and 29, 
Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? Again, church, ultimately we must listen and look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is the final message. He is the final word. Again, as the writer continues at the end of verse 3 and into verse 4, he begins to outline this way. He begins to outline this gospel message in how it has been delivered, confirmed, and authoritatively authenticated. Look at the end of verse 3 and verse 4 as well. Where he says, the message was delivered at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now again, if we turn to the Gospel of Mark, first considering how this was declared first by the Lord, we find this first proclamation at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In verse 15 of chapter 1, it says that after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That's the heart of the message. Repent and believe the good news. Again, we learned back in verse 2 of chapter 1, in these last days, God the Father has spoken to us by His Son. And so the full and the final message of the gospel is one that has been now delivered, not by angelic beings or temporary prophets, but by the final and better prophet, priest, and king, Jesus Christ. Again, the writer continues to help us understand this and how superior the message truly is. In fact, he shows us this further when he tells us that the message Christ delivered was attested to us by those who heard. Again, we know from the Gospels, the apostles were eyewitnesses. They were eyewitnesses to Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. They heard the message firsthand by the Lord, and then they turned to declare the message to others. And this is what the writer is making clear in how he identifies himself. He is one who has heard the message from one who first heard it, who received it from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in this, the writer of Hebrews is showing us the authority and the authenticity in the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, We find in John chapter 15, when Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples prior to the cross, Jesus told them in verse 26 and 27, when the Helper comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you will bear witness about me because you have been with me from the beginning. Now again, the book of Acts is also very helpful. Later in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus told the apostles after his resurrection and right before his ascension, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Again, as we find later in Acts chapter 5, verse 30 and 32, as Peter and the other apostles were confronted by the Sanhedrin, they proclaimed, the God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And so the message would go forth that the Lord had proclaimed, now through apostolic witnesses, which God authenticated to all 
who were hearing their witness. And notice again in verse 4 that the writer of Hebrews tells us, God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, it is difficult to summarize in our time the vast amount of New Testament texts that really reveal to us how God bore witness through signs and wonders and various miracles. But one thing I think that is important to say is the fact that these things are not normative in the scripture. They are profoundly important for a very specific reason. And especially in examining the evidence of of signs and wonders and various miracles in redemptive history, we need to understand that they had a distinct purpose in God declaring and authenticating his message. And so if anyone ever comes to you and says, I can divinely lengthen your leg, or I can give you a word for the day, we are right to say, why? For what purpose? If God has declared and authenticated his message of the Lord Jesus Christ, why would we need those things? Again, we find in in the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17, at Jesus' baptism. It says, Immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. God bore witness to the ministry of the Son. And again, I think a vital text for the Christian to understand is the transfiguration of Jesus in Matthew 17, where Matthew writes in verse 3 through 5, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. Such a Peter thing to say. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowing them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So there before the apostles stood the three great prophets of redemptive history who performed signs and wonders and various miracles, and they were messengers of God. God worked through them in the signs and wonders and various miracles. And now in this moment of redemptive history, at the transfiguration of Jesus, God the Father says, listen to my son. He is the better and the final word. He is the final sign and wonder and miracle here before you. And even further, the writer of Hebrews reminds us at the end of verse 4, That in the early church, this message was confirmed and it was shared by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And believe me when I tell you, there is much discussion over these gifts. There is much discussion. I think many of you know what position I would take and it doesn't matter if you don't. But ultimately, what we need to do is deal with the text. What's the purpose here? What were the purpose of the gifts? What's the point of prophecy and tongues and miracles? And I think the writer is saying it's to point you to the message of Jesus Christ. Again, at Pentecost, we find that the prophecy of Joel 2 was fulfilled. What the Old Testament proclaimed was fulfilled. And Luke records this for us in Acts chapter 2, verse 2 through 4. That suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Again, when we read that, we ought to ask, why did that happen? What did God, the Holy Spirit, give these believers utterance to speak in tongues about? Well, verse 11 is explicitly clear. The people said, we hear them telling us in our own languages the mighty works of God. 
And what does Peter say in his sermon in response to this proclamation? Verse 22 and through 24 of Acts 2. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. We could read on to hear this amazing Pentecost sermon, but the heart of the matter is, this is the message of the gospel which God has now revealed through the witnesses of Christ's church. It is the message of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Ephesians 3 that this mystery and this message of Christ was not made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This is the message that you ought to pay closer attention to. Jesus Christ, the true and final word. And so we find in the New Testament, in the early church, the whole Godhead has authoritatively proclaimed the whole revelation of Jesus Christ so that the whole church may be equipped with the whole gospel. And so brothers and sisters, we are reminded that no matter whatever gimmicks or methods people may suggest to us or say we ought to go back to, at the most basic level, Jesus Christ is the better and final word. There is no other message to look upon. Jesus Christ is the better and final word. There is no other message. There is no other messenger. There is no other word. There is no other revelation or plan. It is Jesus Christ, a sure foundation. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And what has he said in John 14, 6? No one comes to the Father but through him. And so we ought to pay closer attention to what we've heard. And so this morning, do not neglect the message of Christ because you will not escape the wrath of God in your unbelief. But you can certainly find life. You will only find life in the Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And so you ought to pay much closer attention to Jesus Christ who is the better and final word. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for all that we have read and learned and looked upon in this time. Lord, truly, it has reminded us and it is encouraging us to all the more look unto Christ. God, I pray that for any who might be here who feel that need for Christ. Lord, may they call upon you. Lord, I pray that if we feel the heavy hand of your discipline, that we would not turn back from it, but that we would bow before you in submission and repent. Lord, if we are those who have hit cruise control, whatever the reason may be, maybe because of serious difficulties, maybe because of utter pain or fatigue, maybe it is because of an endless string of sicknesses or or challenges, or Lord, maybe it is because we even have just simply been lazy. God, may you confront us and also deal gently with us. Lord, lead us to repentance that we may turn and confess the truth. God, we thank you that while you give us these warnings, you have also dealt mercifully with us. And so, God, we ask that by your Spirit, may you help us to pay much closer attention to the message. God, we ask that you may guide us in these things
Lord, help us to look to Christ and listen to him. We pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together again and continue in our worship.